All right, we talked about the joint hierarchy of each joint up going up along the body causes more injury and more control over the opponent. I want to talk about a couple of other things that are related to this. The first one is the idea of injuring to degree is what some people refer to that as. Uh, Jiu-Jitsu really gives you a lot of power. We're not stuck in one simple paradigm where either I hit the guy or I don't, or I kick the guy or I don't. You can't half kick a guy, you can't three quarters kick a guy. So sometimes it's difficult to make that decision how much force to use. But by understanding the joint hierarchy and practicing the techniques I'm going to show you, we're going to have complete control of the situation. We're going to be able to cause him enough discomfort that he simply wants to go away, go away, all the way up to severely injuring or incapacitating him. That's the power of jujitsu and the techniques we're going to, going to use. Now, along that same line of injuring to degree and the joint hierarchy is the legal idea of use of force. That's really important to, to that idea. Not only do you have the choice, you may be in a public area, you've got witnesses, you may be a peace officer or a security guard, and you have to be really careful about how much force you use. So I'm going to show you techniques all along that force continuum based largely on the joint hierarchy and it's going to give you complete control of the situation. All right, let's begin now with our top 10 um, most common attacks that we did and we'll look at ways to finish off them. Now we talked about pushes. Pushes are actually one of the more difficult situations to deal with simply because most martial arts either ignore them or don't have any realistic solutions. The reason why is based again on this idea of um, the appropriate level of force. Legally that's really important. So the most common act of aggression you're going to have to face is the person pushing you. Um, a very low level version of that, probably the, the very tip of the assault iceberg would be somebody putting their finger in you. Now remember, legally, at least in, in countries that use the, the common law, the US, Canada, Australia, any place based on, on English law, nobody has the right to touch you in any threatening way. So the moment somebody touches you, even like this, they're already in an assault or technically a battery where they make contact you are allowed to defend yourself. The problem now becomes how much force can I use? And that's where a lot of systems break down. They don't give you the real tools to survive in the real world. They tell you, oh, our system is too deadly. It can only be used in a life and death situation. Okay, what about the other 99.9% .9 of real world self-defense? So the problem with ignoring these, which isn't always a bad idea, I'm not saying we should take an aggressive stance every time, but certain people use these low-level attacks to see how you're going to respond. They're probing you, they're testing you, what one self-defense author called the interview. And in this case, if you pass the interview, he means he's going to ramp up the force level, he's going to attack you. All right, so the first one is something like someone poking on your chest like this. Now, legally, what am I going to do? There's really not a lot you can do when he starts to push you. We know the slide, let's begin with that one. So he pushes on me, or he pokes on my chest. Now the poke the chest, we can play a little game, keep poking. This is actually fairly hard to do to grab the finger a lot of the time if it's moving a lot. So it's a good drill to start with. We'll call this the snatch the pebble from my hand grasshopper, if you remember the old Kung Fu series. So when he's pointing his finger at me and actually makes contact, at that time, I have a right to grab his finger. Now how much force I can use, if I give a little pain here and let him go, he probably won't grab me again. If he does, I probably have the right to ramp up the force level, my own response. So he starts doing that, I use this technique, I'm able to grab it. Keep going, you gotta practice, it's not always as easy as it looks because I'm trying to keep my eyes on him and uh, grab his finger at the same time. Now when I grab the finger, remember, if I wanna cause some pain, I have to get a good grip on it. I gotta hold the whole finger, just like I'm holding a uh, twig on a branch. And if I wanna cause pain, I gotta pull with the bottom part of my hand and push with my top part. Just like you'd break a twig off of a, off of a tree. So with this, I can cause a little bit of pain, enough that it'll go to his brain and he'll think, man, maybe I shouldn't have been sticking my finger in his chest. Now, if this is the second time he's, he's done that, I gotta ramp up the force level, but what's appropriate? Well, one thing is I can maybe go behind it like this, use it to get a hammer lock or a dirty box clinch, which we're gonna talk about a lot later. So while the finger lock in itself isn't that effective, it allows me to move into other things. Okay, so a simple one here is to put this behind his back. Boom, I can go to a hammer lock where I've got a lock on his shoulder or 
what we call a dirty box clinch, which allows me to hit the guy, put him on the ground, do a lot of things. We're going to be covering the dirty box clinch a lot.